So how do you go about preparing for something like this? Because uh, I would imagine there's not like a lot of footage of Vivian Vance being, you know, not Ethel. Right. That was the, that was very tricky for me. Um, I, I was determined to find something and finally somebody sent me this clip seconds long and it was Desi introducing Vivian uh, to the studio audience before they started taping. Uh, it was just her walking downstage taking a bow and it completely, it just blew my mind because I mean out came this woman with uh, you know just the most the perfect spine and a woman that's aware of her hips and she like sashays down and takes the most elegant bow and I thought, wow, to go from that to then completely bringing your weight down and playing Ethel, and that's where she lived. <laughs> it fascinated me, and that is, of course, because Vivian Vance was a, a very successful theater actress. She was a leading lady. She was an ingenue. She was a very desirable woman. She was a torch singer, you know. Uh, so to have just even seconds with her as as who she really was was priceless and that, and that just alone was enough for you to sort of uh grab onto that's what i had that's what i held on to and then when you watch her i mean it is a dancer's body and that's something to be honored because that doesn't leave you you know mm -hmm. uh and i was just very impressed that that's the woman that came out and then the woman who came on stage after night and day did you know that uh, she and uh, William Frawley like hated each other? I did not know that until <laughs> until I started researching this, and they certainly, they certainly, genuinely, very much disliked each other. Do you know if they ever like made up like after the show or anything like that? I you know what I just heard. I mean, this is again a rumor, but I just heard this the other day that upon hearing the news of William Frawley's death, rumor has it that Vivian said champagne for everyone. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm going with it because I think it's a fabulous story, so. Um, you and JK work so well together. Uh, had you guys ever met before? Or like the chemistry between you two is fantastic. You know, interestingly enough, we had just worked on the final season of Goliath together. We didn't actually get, to, I got to glare at him in a courtroom, but we didn't actually get to exchange any, you know, lines or really work together. So it was just so funny when I found out the news that I got cast, I just walked over to his trailer and I knocked on his door and I said, I guess we're doing this. And he goes, I guess so. And then I had the great privilege of actually, you know, sharing the screen with him on this. I could, watch a whole, I could watch a whole film of you two bickering back and forth to each yeah. other. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, like working with um, Aaron Sorkin, I mean, what was it like to kind of say his words and, and, and to actually be directed by him? Well, first of all, a great honor. Uh, and it's very cool <clears throat> when you get a script that you almost have to treat like a score. You know, it's almost like you're reading music in a way. I felt similarly when I <clears throat> worked on like Oscar Wilde or even Shakespeare, it's that if you don't honor the rhythm, if you don't honor the musicality, it just won't work. Um, and what's lovely about that is you have to earn your pauses in the most elegant way with an Aaron Sorkin script, which I appreciate very much. It's almost like uh, like when you're singing, you know, you have to pre uh like plan where you're gonna pause and take a breath. And take a breath, exactly. And that's that's why it's so exciting because you know, people might say, Oh, it's fast. It's not it's not that it's fast. It's that you you have to listen to what the music is. And that's that's it. So how does it work um, actually getting a part like this? Uh, because the people, uh, especially of a sp uh, people of a specific age, remember these characters, these uh, these actors. Um, uh, does someone call you up and say, "Hey, are you interested?" Or do you hear about it and sort of ask to be seen? Um, I was asked to uh, put myself on tape. Uh, this was at the height of the pandemic, and I am very, very deeply technically incapable of doing anything. So I called my, my, my lovely friends over uh, and <laughs> they helped me light it and they helped me work the camera and push the buttons with the thing that I can't do. And somehow uh, we were able to create a tape and send it in. 
so I mean, uh, self tapes are like the thing now. Like, how do you just loathe them? Yes, I do because it's it's. I much prefer being in the room because that energy fuels you. I think as a performer. So when you're at home, yeah, you could take as many takes as you want to. Sure, but I don't know. I'm I'm old school. I like to be in person. <laughs> Yeah, I'm an actor yeah. too, so I, I totally know what you're saying, yeah. You know what I mean? Like you feed off the energy of the room in a different way that just puts you in the moment and, and raises everything up a bit. I think the only thing good about self-tapes is you don't have to deal with traffic going and, and coming home and going, yeah. That's the ticket, absolutely. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, um, so you know, uh, everything I see you in, your performances are always so like fearless. Um, I mean, this and Stan and Ollie, uh, I saw you in Venus and Fur and brought on Broadway. Uh, are you ever nervous? Like when you first get a part, like, uh, thinking yourself, like, how the heck am I going to do this? Uh, nervous is a kind way to put it. I would say, uh, paralyzing anxiety, I think would be more <laughs> accurate. Yeah. I've never done anything where at first I'm like, are you insane? You're never, <laughs> it's never going to happen. You're never going to be able to pull this off. And then hopefully, if the gods are on your side, you slowly get over yourself, which is what's happening in that moment. And you make it about what you're doing or you make it about the character that you're playing. Because you don't matter. But at first, of course, you feel like you do. But at the end of the day, nobody cares about you because you're, you're in service of somebody else. And if you could kind of sooner rather than later shift that focus, then it becomes, I w I'm not gonna say enjoyable, but it becomes interesting. Are you like even nervous like on the first day on set too? Again, very kind to use the word nervous. <laughs> Two seconds from passing out, I would think would be more accurate, yes. Mm -hmm. For me, selfishly, I would love to know like the beginnings of your process of how you prepare for a part, like, like something like this. I mean, I go back to my like what what I think works because you have I can't you can't right away take in the whole picture right so I take I try to break it down as much as I can for myself I try to be as practical as I can first before I allow myself to be emotional so I always break the script down the way I have since school it's what do I say what does the playwright say about me or what in this case what does the screenwriter say about me what do others say about me what do I say about myself and then you really kind of get just basic information that you need from the script. Then you read it again. Then you just start breaking down the scenes as much as possible. And in this case, I had to learn also the movements or you know of this iconic uh, beloved woman, uh, the character rather. Uh, and so I worked with my wonderful dialect coach, Deb Hecht, and we worked on subtleties within Vivian's voice and then trying to get up there in pitch for uh, for Ethel. You guys recreate some uh, like uh, classic scenes uh, from the show. It, um, how, how did you go about like, it was just like remote, like mo memory and like, you know, cause I saw like a thing like where you guys were, uh, it was like almost literally like a mirror image of what you guys <laughs> were doing, you know, each, how yeah. did you guys go about doing that? Well, I was having a hard time just looking either at my iPad or, or a TV, so I was able to get a projector and I projected the scenes onto a wall so I could make her kind of as big as I could and I would kind of move with her just so I could kind of see um, more of the subtleties within her movement. That helped me a lot because it was kind of tough on, on a smaller screen, so I'm glad that worked out. <laughs> um, so I just got a couple more questions. Um, after leaving uh, school, graduating school, you got Venus and Fur pretty quick. Um, uh, how did you get that part and what would be like a sort of a life-changing career uh, show? I auditioned. I, I auditioned for it. Um, I was encouraged not to. I don't think people were really a fan of the script. I said, I love it. I said, I want to go in. Uh, and it worked out. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. Yeah. Um, any plans to do more theater? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, very much so. Uh, what was the very first professional job that you booked? First professional? Oh, I'll tell you what it was. I was I was asked to do the voiceover for a German Barbie doll when I was, I believe, eight years old, 
And uh, so I, I went into his studio and we recorded three lines that this Barbie doll would say, her name was Candy, and you'd pull the string and she would say, comb in my hair and comb my hair and then something else. Ech stark, I remember was the other one, totally cool. And, <laughs> uh, and so it was my first check and my mother allowed me $20, which I spent on kissing coolers, lip glosses. I don't know if you remember, Maybelline did those back in the day and the rest they put in my savings account. But that was my first professional job. Nice. And then finally, um, what has been your worst audition ever? I mean, several. But I think <laughs> the one that stands out is I was auditioning for Lambda. Uh, and I did Lady Percy from Henry IV Part Two, And I did uh, a monologue by Jill from uh, The Big Funk, Shanley's Big Funk. And so I introduced my pieces, and I said, I'll be doing uh, Jill from The Big Funk. And the woman said, excuse me? And I go, funk, funk, not, no, no, I didn't say, I said funk, I'm sorry. And then just from then on, and then she just looked at me, she goes, in your own time. And I just <laughs> couldn't get it together after that. Because she, she, thought, she thought I said a naughty, but I didn't. I was just saying the title of the piece. Um, yeah. Well, hey, so thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. And again, I think you're great. And the movie's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nice talking to you. Yeah. See ya. Bye.